complete at the same time. And how that is, is a complete mystery. So I think as we read through it, I think we just want to remember that um, we're not looking for uh, all the answers, but we just want to try to take in what the text has to say to us. And one thing I found really helpful in my studies when I'm doing Bible study and discussion is to just do what's called a very careful reading of the text. So to put a, what are we, and again, it's a little bit long, but I'm going to go ahead and lead us. Maybe I should read from the film at that. This is part of our story. This can help inform 
and what we are likely to, what, what we're like and what God is like and how we are um, in relationship with each other, with ourselves and with him. So there's so much, this uh, the word that I keep, keeps coming to me is it's just so pregnant <laughs> with, um, with meaning for us. And maybe that's my bias. But it is. It's so full. It's just got so much to say to us. So I wrote these questions out, kind of to hopefully they're not too leading, (laughs) transparent about what I think we should discuss. But we don't have to get through all of them. If this conversation goes on a completely different course and we only get through number one, that's fine with me. I don't have an agenda. So. as we start out, I think it, uh, when we're doing any study, it's important to look at the text itself. What, what are we reading? Are we reading, it's called a genre, right? Are we reading, what, what type of text is this? We know genre very naturally. We know whether we're reading a telephone book and how to interpret that. We know if we're reading a comic strip or USA Today or Washington Post. You read those two types, even those two types of newspapers you read differently, right? I think USA Today writes to eighth grade reading level. Mm-hmm. Washington Post, I think, a little bit higher than that. <laughs> um, or if you're reading one of <coughs> Dr. Calvin's papers, you know, it's going to be different from the comic strip, maybe. So, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> maybe some humor, I don't know. But genre is so important because we, we have to understand what is the text, wor- what's it worth? Is, it, is this a science book? Is this uh, a psychology book? Is this Anthropology, what is it? So in question one I ask, um, if we look at the text in Hebrew and the language it was originally written in, the word that, um, in verse one it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. So crafty is how it gets interpreted. In Hebrew it's the word arum. And then the word for naked in Hebrew is arum. So if you're reading in Hebrew, it's sort of this wordplay, is this rhyming, right? So you see rhyming in a text. If you're reading a text that's rhyming, what type of genre do you usually find that in? Poetry. In poetry, right? And so does the poetic <laughs> So if we agree that Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in particular, and, and even more, so much of the Old Testament is poetic. So the Hebrew writing, this ancient Hebrew writing is poetic. If this poetic genre, if if this is poetry, if we can agree on that, what does that mean to you as you consider this text, as you read through it? Or should it, does it mean anything to you, or do you still say, you know what, I'm still gonna just read it, literally, or have you ever considered it before, and how might it change or inform how we're looking at the text? When something is poetic, I thought it would be interesting to ask Sabrina, because she really, she is a poet, <laughs> poetess. You know, what's different when you write a poem and you write a letter to someone, just describing them what happened, and then if you write a poem, what are some of the major differences that you find? Well, you talk about poetic license, that the poetry doesn't seem to have to be exactly literal, exactly reality. But then it's a lo- it reflects a larger reality of the writer usually, right? Like, Sometimes, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think the interesting thing is you don't really know, right? Mm-hmm. It's, you don't know. There's that mystery. I think it's so important to remember there's a mystery behind what we're reading to. I think about poetry often as having um, symbolic language. Okay, good. That's Not necessarily, good. you know, connected to what you said about that there are often there are themes and, you know, a book can be a book, but it's also be a lot more than a book. Right, so a serpent, what is a serpent then? If we're we're reading about a serpent, we're reading about a tree, we're reading about fruit, what do we think? Uh, So is this a literal serpent? Is this a literal tree? Is this literal fruit? Is it something that you can pick up and eat that they're talking about? Yeah, it's pretty literal to me. It could be. Uh, Women are frequently afraid of snakes, and that's part of the curse. Does it say it was a snake? Yeah, a snake or a serpent or a serpent or a snake. I'm just, I'm not, I, I don't necessarily have the answers. It's sort of a. But it says it was a snake or a serpent, right? It says it's a serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty. The serpent. 
more crafted than what? Than any of the wild animals. So yeah. that's good to know. So we're talking about the wild animals. Mm -hmm. po poetic history. Now, we always have thought that the serpent was or is a snake, and now we're talking about maybe it's not. Is it symbolic of something that we need to hear? I mean, this morning? Because what we have literally in the past have heard that it was the snake that enticed uh, Eve. And Dorothy brought it up again, and I'm like, you're, you're saying that, and then, then I'm hearing symbolic, and I'm hearing words like that, and I'm putting things in my head, and I'm like, okay, it's not coming out like what I grew up with. Right. And I think that's a, what's important is when I, in the beginning, when I said not bringing presuppositions to the text, we do. It's so hard not to because of, of our context, right? But how many of us have seen classical or Renaissance art with a naked woman and a tree and a snake and an apple? We've all seen those, those works of art, right? When we were little, it's probably some of the first time we saw like naked people. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> naked, look at that, you know? You just have those memories, right? Like yeah. the Dave, you know, whenever you see the first time you saw the statue of David, right? He's naked. Oh, it's 3D naked. You know, we, we have to we bring those to the text. We think of that's what David must have looked like. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. So when we see those those pictures, how how are those artists informed? Who informed them? And and so now we have to try to come to this text and say, God inform us. We have so much of what we need by the Spirit of God right now, helping us to see what we need to see in the text. Is it important if it's a snake or a serpent or a centipede or a militant? Is that important? What's more important is the large, what's going on, I think, what's larger, what's going on more largely in the text? Educate me again. Is there a difference between a snake and a serpent? Well, I think where the snake comes in, when people go to the snake, this and the curse, so it talks about in verse 17, it says, oh no, sorry, <coughs> the curse of the serpent. So God curses the serpent first, and he says, cursed are you above all livestock. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. But is, is he, in Hebrew, I don't know if it's snake or serpent, are they the same? It's a good question, and I, I don't have the answer to it right this second. I, could, I can look it up for you. I mean, I don't I don't think the, the I don't think it distinction is. which makes it sound like serpent is uh, a more powerful creature or uh, a snake is more I'm powerful. sure there I'm sure I can't say for sure if there's a two separate words for snake and serpent in the biblical Hebrew because there's only about six thousand words in biblical Hebrew. It's really small. So each word has you know, it has like three to five to ten meanings. You know, that's the beauty of that language, is, but it also makes it difficult for interpretation. Yeah, but it sounds to me like both you and Betty assumed when you read this that there were two different critters here, a serpent no. and a snake. No, 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 no. no. Okay. She's just saying, are, are we not talking, are we talking about a snake or not? And I'm saying, my general answer to that is it's really not important. What is more important is that we're talking, if there's a character, there's one character here right. that's looked at as mm -hmm. enticing. Which would suggest to me that he might have been upright. 
prior to that. Oh, yeah. Right. Why would he, otherwise, why would he say yeah. not everybody wants your belly? Yeah. 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 So and so what a great observation that you start, this, this character, whoever, whatever it is, mm -hmm. starts out as what the poet would call one of the wild animals. And, and now on the belly, so that's such a good observation. So that kind of tells us what part of this curse it had. So it became sort of lower, it became less, <coughs> maybe less, less like it's uh, as it was created to be. We, un we, yeah. we have to kind of believe that the serpent was one of God's creation. It doesn't say, you know, it, it's more crafty, but it's crafty necessarily good or bad. Is it evil? You know, there's a huge question in like, did, where did evil come from? Okay, well, we'll never have enough time to answer that question, right? But the text doesn't say it, just says that there was a serpent. And so there is a creation, and that Pat's point is so great that now what this being was created to be, part of the curse is that now it's on its belly. Now it's different. It's changed somehow because of its action. Call it a bit. I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to just say that. Yeah. I, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, we even, yeah. we even that, right? Just like, oh, bad. It's the bad man. So that's a great, great observation. So these are the kinds of questions I love to kind of get into as we look at this. Because um, it's not the Sunday school cookie cutter version of this story. And it'll mean something. So Pat's observation is going to mean something to us today because the Spirit of God is going to keep weaving things into, us, into our hearts and our spirits as we discuss it. Okay, so, um, so we're looking at this poetry. We're not always so sure what everything means. Talking about Adam. Eve, the serpent. You always have really good questions and answers. Yes. So your presence is really important. Okay, so uh, there's questions on the handout. If you and if you guys have other questions along the way, just talk. So we have five more minutes. <laughs> um, so really quickly. Uh, I think maybe what would be interesting to look at, uh, if anyone has already kind of read through the questions, if, if there's one that jumps out that you want to discuss, we can do that. Um, I do. Okay, go ahead, Jenny. I like number five. In the New Testament epistles, Christians are urged to be like Christ. In light of this, what are some of the main differences between wanting to be like God and striving to be like Christ? Hey, I thought that's really interesting because really what they're saying is, you know, um, If you, if you eat of this, you will be like God, in verse 5, knowing good and evil. And there's this separation that God seems to have created in this created order between not the man and woman not knowing. Um, we'd have to go back to Genesis 2 to really read the exact uh, um, directive that he gave um, about the tree. Because Eve gets it wrong, right? She, she, mis she misspeaks about what God said. Like, no, if you touch it, you'll die. Well, God didn't say if you touch it, you'll die. He said if you eat of the fruit of it, right? So she made God's laws more restrictive, which I think we do that a lot. And that gets us into trouble because then we want to break out of what we think, you know, like we're only supposed to wear skirts. So then, you know, you go off and become a rebellious teen. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't say that in the Bible. But so if you restrict what God has to say, so if we look back in chapter 2, um, in verse 16, it says, God commanded the man... You are, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So that's, that was what God want, didn't want them to do. He didn't want them to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, because then you will, your eyes will be open. In verse chapter 3, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked. So they have this sort of understanding now about knowing between good and evil. So they become more like God, which God punishes them for that. Um, it seems a little bit unfair, I think, a lot of times. And some people will just close this book and say, I can't deal with that, and this kind of God is not fair. Gives you, tells you not to do something, you do it, and then you're in trouble. But really, what's going on? What's going on? So if we want 
to, um, you know, be all off the of rent to be like Christ, follow me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We want to be little Christ, Christians means little Christ. We want to be Christians, we want to be like Christ, but here we're being urged, like, don't be like God, because that's, so what is, it, what is the difference? What do you guys think some of the main differences are between wanting to be like God and then um, wanting to be like Christ, being Christ-like? Is it just enough? Okay, well, I think that Christ was more, like, merciful because God was, he was wrathful because of sin. So, yeah. He doesn't want us to, like, take revenge on people, but to help them and be more merciful. So, if God's the one who takes his wrathful, because we would have to have agree that God is wrathful. We have, mm-hmm. If we want to believe in God, we have to believe that about him, too. Um, it's a great point because Christ showed us to have mercy. And to leave, what does it say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Mm-hmm. So can we leave the wrath to God, or do we need to take revenge? I mean, how many, I don't know a lot about gangs, but how many gang problems would be solved if vengeance, if they said, we don't need to retaliate? Probably all. Number, number four. It's not like that's you. Don't, don't retaliate. retaliate. <laughs> right? That's the biggest yeah. thing with the gangs is, you kill my brother, not to kill your brother. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I think. I don't, like I said, I don't know a lot about gangs. But from the shows I've watched on TV, that seems to be a big problem. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think that's a really good point, Matthew. But stepping back from that is the fact that um, God is a judge. Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. In other words, it's not our place to judge. Right. It's God's place to judge. And when we're like, we want to be like God, we want to be judges. Mm-hmm. We want to be judged. Mm-hmm. That's great. I think that's such an important point because who has, who knows more? Who has more knowledge? Right. And, and that's sort of what, in the same direction I was going with the, thinking about the question. I think the difference for me is um, the ways that he didn't want them to try to be like God was to be in charge, to be to have power, as you would if you're the judge, to be in control, being on the same plane as God and being equal with him, versus when it talks about being like Christ, I think it's the emphasis tends to be more like in how you behave towards other people, not in in um, having Christ's power. It, when we talk about being like Christ, it's about loving others and sacrificing and following Jesus' path of putting himself lower than others and being a servant. So I think for me that question has to do with seeking power versus you know the power of God and being as an equal with God versus um, humbling yourself and taking the lesser seat of power towards mm-hmm. one another and that and in that way being like Christ. And mm-hmm. I think that's a really important difference because I think one is making a big mistake to try to be on the same level as God and not let him be in control, and the other is the right thing to do. I think it's an, a really important distinction because we often will be um, kind of hard on ourselves, too. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I think she's a more like, more like Christ, mm-hmm. but he's our example. He's the one who is the true human. He's the, he's the example of humanity. And here we had the our original human ancestors, they they failed. We read about that in Romans 5. And then God brings some redemption into their lives. But all along the rest of the story, we're trying to find, re- God keeps redeeming this one mistake, this big mistake here in chapter 3. Until we get to Jesus. And Jesus, he fixes it all. He brings this redemption to um, what Adam and Eve were originally supposed to be able to enjoy. And so now we can go back to, well, they'll say, go back to the garden. We can go back to this relationship with God where there wasn't isolation from him. Because what happens in chapter 3 is this increasing isolation from God because of the choice that they made to want to be like him, not to follow him, to be obedient to him, to be loving like him, but to be like him. And we see that through chapter 11. Every 
character wants to be like God. Mm -hmm. They want to rise up by the end. We see the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. They want to be up in the heavens. They want to be like God. Mm -hmm. And in the ancient world, that was really important to become a God. I mean, Pharaoh was considered yeah. to be God. Yeah. People wanted divinity. That's what they want. And people in this culture today want divinity too. The spiritual, the new age movement. Um, there's this, they want to be enlightened. We want to be more, a better human. We want to be more than human. Mm -hmm. But we need to kind of accept our humanity. And mm -hmm. I, I want to finish my thought and then we'll get to um, mm -hmm. uh, There's this increase, I think what's really important to look at in this, because we probably don't have time to talk much more, but in chapter three you see an increasing, uh, what I talked about, increasing isolation. So you see they cover themselves. As soon as they realize, oh my gosh, I'm naked. Like mm -hmm. they're no longer comfortable with who they are. Mm -hmm. And when we're not in Christ, we're not comfortable with who we are. Mm -hmm. We are psychologically alienated from ourselves. We don't like, I don't like how I looked. I had to cover myself up. Mm -hmm. And God's first act of redemption is he covers them more properly. Instead of a fig leaf, he kills an animal and covers them. So he, it's his first, you know, bloodshed happens for these people who have alienated themselves from him. So then there's a spiritual um, alienation. They run and hide from God. Adam runs and hides. We're meant to be able to commune with God in the garden. Now we can do that in Christ with the Holy Spirit. There's a social isolation where there starts a blame game. We all know the blame game. No, oh, you made me do it. She made me do it. Me. Right. There's social isolation. Should we, you know, do we fight here or are we trying to be one? Okay. And then there's even the vocational isolation. I hate my job. <laughs> this is terrible. Job. In the soil. I just weeded yesterday. Look at this again. All work becomes labor. Uh, the work of a woman, primarily in this culture, the only work she had to do was bear children. Now, I hate being pregnant. I hate pushing babies out. It's so hard, you know? There's a, you'll, you'll see it is. There's emotional isolation. There's physical. So we see this, and this is. You will die. If you eat from the fruit of the garden, mm -hmm. you will die. So you see this beginning of death. It's not so much the literal death. We all know that we're going to die. There's no question whether we're going to physically die. But are we going to suffer these other types of death? Day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. And are we going, how are we going to escape it? Through the rest of the book gets to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Jesus brings us out of that. And I think Anytime we, I always like to go back to Genesis when I'm, when I'm struggling. I go, where, what's, what was it really supposed to be like in the beginning? Where, where, how, what did God, God created this beautiful place for us where we could be one with each other, where we didn't have separation. We felt um, community with Him, community with ourselves. And now um, this isolation starts. So through Christ, we can kind of get back to that. So that was chapter 8, was about how Christ sort of, I call it, reversing the curse. Um, you know, we were cursed by this serpent who was crafty, and our nakedness, you know, was started to bother us. Um, but God covers us. You know, it says in uh, verses 20 and 21, it says that, um, well, actually, <coughs> verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Clothed them. So... That's always God's intention. He's our creator, but he's always also our redeemer. And we see in this chapter the beginning of his redemption for us. And I think that's the most important thing to see out of it. It's fun to talk about the snakes and the serpents, too. I, mean, I enjoy that. I'd love to talk about it more. Um, but we're, we're probably out of time. Um, and Brian, I'm sorry. I know you had something to say. If you still have that. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I lose my train of thought really quickly, so I, <laughs> I didn't want to do that. Um, are there any closing thoughts, especially from anyone who hasn't shared yet? Is there anything, any other thoughts about where we're going? Or? Okay, so look for that pattern in the rest of the study, mm -hmm. chapters 4 through 11. Look for that pattern. Of, okay, this was the first misstep. Um, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. It just starts spiraling down. I mean, it starts quickly. The next thing is Cain and Abel, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just one thought that this whole thing of judging. Really, when we start judging our body or, or 
or judging the snake or the, the woman or the man or and start judging them and, and blaming them. Really what we're doing is blaming God. God who made our bodies, God who made the, made all of this and we start when we start judging what we're doing is we're judging God and we're blaming God. Like you made yeah. this. Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks and a so, lot for these yeah. notes. Yeah, I mean it's <laughs> it's God, it's really it's so true. And we see that in who do we see humans are in Genesis, um, you know, in the creation narrative one through three, where where we talked about it in the uh, introduction. We've been made in the image of God. So every person here has is an image bearer of God. There's something in you, a mis mystery about who you are, that I should be able to see God in you. Something mm -hmm. about you is reflective of who God is. Mm -hmm. and that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And you should see every person, no matter how offensive they are, no matter how much they might hate you, dislike you, not share your political views, they are an image bearer of God. And at the very least, you can honor someone for that. You know, and say, how could I honor my mother and father? You know what my father did to me? Mm -hmm. Can you just honor him for being an image bearer of God? Mm -hmm. Someone who brought you into the world. That's all. Mm -hmm. Honor, you know, that's it. We should, the homeless person on the street bears the image of God. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important way to inform, you know, ourselves about who someone else is Ourselves, it's hardest to love ourselves sometimes, and it's hardest to love the most unlovable. Mm -hmm. 